For most of my career, I was an evangelical Christian leader. I ran a variety of inner city programs. I ran the Mission Year program, Kingdom Works. You worked with me in ministry. For years, you worked with me, starting programs, ministries, mission organizations. You were a colleague. And it got to the point where I was like, I don't believe any of it. The Catacombic Machine, I am Josef. And that was from the trailer of the movie Far From The Tree, made by John Wright from Belfast. It's about Bar Campolo and Tony Campolo. And uh, I haven't seen it yet, but it looks interesting to me. Bart is also the guest of this episode, and we talk about his move from being an evangelical preacher to becoming a secular humanist. There's also a new book out by Bart Campolo and Tony Campolo. It's called Why I Left, Why I Stayed, and you should check it out. If you want to see the movie, you should buy tickets to the Catacomb event in Gothenburg, April 21st and 22nd, real soon. So uh, go to Catacomb, that's with the Swedish spelling, so it's K Catacomb. Dot info and see how you can get your tickets. It's going to be a real interesting event in Gothenburg. Some of Sweden's most interesting theologians will be there and we'll talk about the church in the internet age. But there's also going to be some radical theological moments and some other stuff happening. So I hope that I'll see you there. That's that. You know, I'm a little bit busy. So I just hope that you'll enjoy this episode. This is Bart Campolo. Bart Campolo, thank you for coming on the Catacombic Machine to talk with me. Ah, uh, Joseph, with a name like the Catacombic Machine, <laughs> how could I resist? Yes, uh, it's it's a name that provokes some people and other like it. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I've heard about your dad some 20 years ago, and then I've heard your name a few times. Uh, over the past few years. Wait, wait, didn't you meet my dad? You met uh, my dad. I talked to him a little bit in Hawaii, in Honolulu. I uh, listened to him lecture at an evangelical convention. And to be honest, he was the most interesting guy there. So I actually have a book by him here in my bookshelf somewhere. He is often the most, in, in a room full of evangelicals, my dad is often the most interesting guy there. He wasn't on the main stage. He was in some seminar. That's where I met him. So that was actually why I could talk to him because the main hall was like 5,000 people, yeah. crazy evangelicals who thought that God put a cross in space in order for us to then see it with the Hubble telescope and start believing that Jesus died for our sins. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, so we want to introduce you because I know uh, some of the listeners know who you are, but most people, at least from Sweden, don't. And then there's probably a few Americans who who don't know your name either. So even even back when I was an evangelical, I was never big in Sweden. Now I know, I know, and I, the Swedish have always been called to me. It's a difficult country to be accepted in. Let's just put it that way. Even if you are a charismatic evangelical preacher, or perhaps especially if you are one of those, you know, or we're skeptics by nature. That's what happens when you live in the dark. You know, if 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 you have nine months of just darkness and snow, and then someone comes along and tells you, "I have a gospel for you." We're just like, go away. As you know, I'm here in Los Angeles, where, where it's just the opposite. It's always sunny and beautiful, and people can come here with any kind of crackpot craziness, and people are like, yeah, I'll listen to that. That, Yeah, that, that sounds rad, that sounds really reasonable to me. Do you know, I, I heard uh, about a research, they asked people if they had a happy childhood, and discovered that people were answering yes disproportionately much if it was good weather outside. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're, we're, you know, it's funny because, you know, our memories are just such liars. I know you want to, you want your listeners to know a little about, bit about who I am. So I'll, if you, do you want me to give you like the two minute biography? Yeah, sure. All right. So as you know, I grew up the son of a famous evangelist 
And people assume when you grow up the son of a famous evangelist that I sprang from the womb praising Jesus. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that I didn't become a Christian until I was in high school, a teenager. Um, and the reason wasn't that I was super rebellious against my parents. It was just that the whole God idea never made any sense to me. Those stories always seemed to me to be just like all the other stories that people were telling me for fun. Um, but when I was in high school, a fellow on my soccer team brought me along to his youth group, which was this kind of, you know, 300 people in a rock and roll band extravaganza. And I walked into this room, man, and these were the nicest kids I had ever met. And they were loving each other and they were connected. And they, there were, there were kids from all different backgrounds being, you know, treating each other in this kind of warm and wonderful way. And I was a nice kid. And I walked into that room and it looked like a club for nice kids. And I just wanted to join. It's funny, you know, because uh, most people think that when you have kids that you need to to teach them all the right things so that they believe what you believe to be true. Uh, but all research shows that kids become very little like their parents. They become like their friends, which the accent of a kid will tell you, you know, if you move and the parents keep their old accent, the kids will adapt to the new environment. And I think this is something similar oh, yeah. that, of course, you know, and you know, growing up with your parents is just what your dad and your mom believes. But suddenly when you're invited into community, things change because then you want to believe what your friends believe so that you can be part of the community. And, and no doubt, like growing up in my family's household, I mean, I, I, I liked my parents and I knew that they were sincere believers and I knew all the language of Christianity from, from bouncing around with my dad. But it wasn't until I was in this group of teenagers that, that, I, that all that stuff got activated and I was like, ah, oh, this, is, this is what I want to do. Now, the thing is, I still didn't believe in God, but I just wanted to be part of the group. So I started to fake it, you know, and go to the Bible studies and I would get up in the morning and do devotions and pray and all that stuff. And, you know, I was just sort of, you know, that whole phrase that we, they use in rehab, fake it till you make it. Yeah. And at some point, a few months into it, you know, I'm on a retreat with – all these young people and we're swaying in the music and singing the songs. And all of a sudden it felt real. You know, I felt something. I, I had the transcendent moment. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, it's funny because the secular people I run around with now, a lot of times they laugh at me and they say, oh, you must feel so silly when you, when you say that you felt God or that you heard the voice of God. And I'm like, oh no, I felt it. I heard it like, like, I, no, no, don't get me wrong. I'm secular now. I believe that was something going on in my brain, but it was real. Yeah, of course. You know, if you don't, if, if people don't believe in transcendent experiences, you know, they haven't been to the right rock concert. They haven't used the right drugs, you know? Yes. You know, Reza Aslan. Okay, Joseph, do you want me to impress you? Yeah. Last night, Marty and I were having dinner with Reza and Jessica at their house. Like we were hanging out, playing with the kids. Like I, it's funny, like, don't, don't get me wrong. Reza and I are not great friends. His wife and I have gotten to be good friends at USC and I know Reza. And so they had us over to dinner and gosh, they have the three cutest little boys you could ever imagine. And so we just played with kids all night until the kids went to bed. Um, but yeah, I know, I know Reza. I know Reza. And I, I know his work very well, too. Because he says that when he was young, he was an evangelical Christian. Yeah, because he was a youth group. Yes. And it's interesting because he says, I can't describe it in any other way than I had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And then he's on Fox News being interviewed and they're like, why are you Muslim? Why are you writing books about Jesus if you don't believe and it's the same thing, right? I mean, the and so and so, I mean, the interesting thing about Reza is Reza and Jessica, they actually still believe in God on some level. Like, whereas, and, and this will kind of finish the story. So like, I'll tell you, I, I'll get to my story real fast because I know you got stuff you want to talk about. So the bottom line is, like Reza, I go into this group, I have this personal encounter, and then I'm a Christian. And then the first thing that anybody asked me to do for Jesus is to go work with inner city kids in a ghetto across the river from Philadelphia, I go there. My mind is blown by urban poverty. I'm a nice kid. I see this. I decide this is what I want to do with my life is fight for the poor, fight for justice. And for the next 30 years, I'm an inner city youth worker and, and I'm doing work not unlike the work that you do there with kind of at risk kids in Sweden. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing all this work. Um, and, and over the course of that time, I did all sorts of ministry stuff. 
you know, I, I preached a lot of places and all this stuff, but my ability, my, my, my commitment to loving relationships and my commitment to social justice and my commitment to kind of a real sense of community grew and grew and grew and grew. And my ability to believe in any kind of supernaturalism died the death of a thousand cuts. When you grew up, you didn't believe really in God. And then you enter into a youth group and you have these experiences. When you look back now, would you say that you ever really believed in it? Oh, absolutely. I really believed in it. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have because you have these experiences of like this intense emotional connection with your group, with this spiritual stuff. You know, you you're reading the Bible and you sense that there's a message in there for you. And of course, you're looking for a message. And so you find one. And and so all these experiences, because I was in the Christian narrative, every kind of wonderful experience I had only confirmed the narrative. Everything that happened was God speaking to me. And so, yeah, no, I was a very sincere believer. What I want to get to is if if you think that you start to believe in God and the Christian message because of the community and the experiences you have in the community, do you think that you're losing faith in God had something to do with the community, your position in the community, or was it sort of a rational thing that you started to question intellectually? Well, I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit of both. I mean, it's a bit of both. I mean, the first thing is that, you know, the first thing I do is go work in the inner city. And, and I go in there with a theology that says that God is in control of the world, like that God does things. Or if he's not in full control, he's able to do stuff. Like we prayed that God would give us traveling mercies when we were going on a long trip. You know, we when somebody was sick, we would pray that God would heal them. When we were trying to lead somebody to Jesus, we would pray that God would open their heart. We actually believe that God could do stuff, right? It's reinforced by people believing I need to give that money to help you guys or something. You know, so you have some people need money, some people have a lot of money. And so it all it, it all works together and everyone is confirmed. Stuff happens. And every now and then you pray for somebody with cancer and they actually get better. You know, like, I mean, it's not that miracles don't happen. It's just that they, you know, I mean, from my perspective now, miracles happen. They happen about as often as they would happen if there was no God, <laughs> you know, like there improbable things happen all the time. Um, it's math. But 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 in my case, I, I, I land as a brand new Christian in this inner city ghetto. And you know what? In the inner city, God doesn't show up nearly as often. Like little girls are getting, you know, beaten up at home and you pray and they don't get delivered. And little kids are in the backseat of cars, living in their cars. Um, and you pray that God will provide housing or a job for their mother. And he doesn't. And so, you know, very quickly, almost within, almost within a year of me becoming a Christian, I had to change my theology. And I came to believe that God didn't pull all the strings and God wasn't in control because for me to believe that God was in control, I would have had to hate God for allowing girls to get raped and little boys to get killed and, and, and old people to be abandoned in the streets. And so what happened was, is I ended up coming up with a new theology that said that God was only in control of those people who surrendered their will to God. And that was why we should do evangelism to try to get more soldiers for the kingdom of God. You see what happens, Joseph, if you start changing your theology in order to accommodate the reality that you see around you, you, you stepped onto a slippery slope because, you know, ultimately, if you keep adjusting God to fit reality, you're on your way out because reality doesn't really have a lot of room for a supernatural force of goodness that's actually like active. I agree a little bit with that, but not fully, because at the same time, this whole narrative that you were given at the get go is also something that's been, been developed over time. The theology you received when you were young is, is, is American evangelicalism. Oh, but don't worry about it, because that theology changed 87 times. I mean, that was the whole point. Yes. But the thing is, it doesn't necessarily mean you're on your way out, because perhaps the whole uh, church changes its uh, theology. 30 years later, I was still in. 30 years later, I had changed. my. The last God I believed in was so amazingly wonderful, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, that God was perfect. Do you think that's a problem if if God suddenly then becomes wonderful? Because, you know, sometimes I get 
a little bit annoyed when people say Jesus was a feminist and Jesus was pro-gay marriage and stuff like that. But at the same time, you know, I'm quite happy that those people believe that rather than where they're coming from. If you're going to believe in God, I want you to believe in a really nice God um, who encourages you to be really kind and has room for everybody and doesn't want to burn anybody forever in hell. Because if the God you believe in burns people in hell, it's a lot easier for you to dismiss other people or to treat other people in, in, in human ways. But if the God you believe in is a universal savior, um, who, who is full of love and acceptance for everybody, um, that that's going to tend to lead to a better outcome in your behavior. So if you're going to believe if you know, and, and human beings are supernaturalist by nature, like we find meaning where it is and we create meaning where it isn't. And so, um, so, so there's, it's not surprising to me that people believe in God and you're right. You know, are there consequences to what kind of God you believe in? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so I'm very supportive of my, like my dad or my friend, Brian McLaren or Shane Claiborne, who are preaching a kind of Jesus that really is wonderful. Like, I'm I'm like, listen, I would much rather have people believing in that God than believing in the God of, you know, uh, Franklin Graham, you know, who's (laughs) who's a total asshole God. Um, And so, and so, you know, so, so, but what I would say is for me, as I kept changing my theology to like, you know, I, I had gave, I had gay friends in college. And so all of a sudden, like my God was okay with gay people. And then like, I had really cool friends who didn't believe in God. And I came to be a universalist who believed that Jesus would save everybody eventually in the end. And, you know, I could find Bible verses to support any of that. You can make the Bible do whatever you want it to do if you're determined enough. And so, you know, for me, the problem was, is that as I kept reshaping and, you know, people who heard me preach over the years, they, they would see this progression in my theology, my progression in the way I understood things. The problem is, is that when you're at the end of the day, when you finally worked God so that he is just perfect and, and, and actually he agrees with you on every point, um, you realize that the God that you're worshiping is a God of your own invention. And for me, that was a very significant realization to go like, this stuff all sounds really good, but I made it up. Some people don't go through that either. You know, some people stay or even make God a much worse God than the ones they, they were presented to when they were. Yeah. Or or what's what I find more important is like I was raised by parents who gave me a strong sense of agency a strong sense that I had the ability to impact other people's lives, that I had the ability to make a difference in the world. And so when I came to theology, if you will, or when I came to the, the, way, the, God, the way the God was presented, I wasn't necessarily prone to trust the guy in the pulpit more than I trusted myself. I was like, he's a guy. I'm a guy. I'm reading the Bible. He's reading the Bible. You know, I'm, I'll listen, but I'm not necessarily enslaved to somebody else's interpretation of this stuff. Yeah. But many people that I know are raised to be compliant with the authority figure. And so what happens to them is I I meet lots of Christians who who believe in a God that is very inconvenient for them. I meet gay Christians who believe in a God who doesn't have room for gay people. I meet women who believe in a God that really keeps women in their place. And, And they don't like the God that they, they they don't like the implications of the God they believe in, but they're like, it's in the Bible. There's nothing I can do about it. (laughs) And so this idea, this idea that we change God to accommodate ourselves may be true on a macro social level. And it may be true for like a a strong willed person like you or me, and probably the people that listen to your podcast. But trust me, brother, there are a lot of people out there that are imprisoned by the theology that they grew up in. Yes, I definitely agree with that. And I think that's why the work that you and I and some of our mutual friends are doing is important because it's sort of opening doors out for people showing it's possible to not actually listen to that guy up there. And, you know, I'm organizing an event where we're going to show your movie. Oh, wow. It's, and by the way, it's not my movie, bro. It's, it's, it's John Wright's movie about me and my dad. And that's important because it's not, believe me, if I made a movie about me and my dad, it would not play that way. Yeah. Okay. So 
is John Wright's movie. Yeah, John Wright. He's a Belfast. He's, he's actually a buddy of Pete Rollins. He's a Belfast. Yeah, I know that. That's how I got the connection. Yeah. Um, and and so at this event, we're going to talk a little bit about how the church is impacted by the internet, because I think you know when you when you grew up in church, maybe hundred years ago or 50, even fifty years ago, there weren't that many other ideas around, but today. It's a whole different story. Even if you, as, as you said, that, that you sort of faked it when you were younger. Yeah. I think you can fake it all, all the way through your youth group and even into adulthood. But it's much easier to fake when there's nothing else impacting you. But now, you know, we have the book printing press changed quite a lot with the church, with the Reformation and so on. But the internet now, I mean, people might sit in their dorm rooms in their evangelical colleges, sort of listening to us speaking right now as a sort of guilty pleasure because they know they shouldn't be listening to this, but maybe there's something they pick up on and th suddenly there's a new new yeah, idea yeah. entering into that space that before were so secluded. To finish my story, but also to speak to your point, long and short of it is about five or six years ago, after like, like I finally came to the realization, so there's nothing left of my spirituality. There's nothing, nothing, not none of my spirituality. There's nothing left of my supernatural credulity. Like I am fully secular. And my wife and I looked at each other and said, what do we do now? Like, I can't be a professional Christian anymore. I don't believe in any of it. And I would, my brand had always been being very authentic and, and really being open with people. And so I know that there are a lot of Christian ministers who don't believe in God anymore, but they just can't figure out what else to do. So they just keep going through the motions. That wasn't an option for me. And so the long and the short of it is, is that I came out of that and I'm living in inner city Cincinnati. I'm trying to figure out what do I do next? And eventually I, 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 I found a guy in, at Harvard, the humanist chaplain at Harvard. And he was unlike all the other atheist groups that I kept bumping into, which were just angry anti-theist groups that were just making fun of people who believe in God and fighting for the separation of church and state. He was running a genuine fellowship of people that sort of were like, we don't believe in God. So what are we, how are we going to make the most of our lives? And what do we do next? And, and, and how do we pursue goodness in this lifetime just because it's a rational decision? It's just the best way of life. And I saw that and I thought, I want to do that. I'm an old youth worker. I'm an old minister. I want to build a community like that. And I ended up out here in Los Angeles because the dean of religious life at USC asked me to come here and be the humanist chaplain at USC. And that's what I do now is I work with young people on the campus. Now, I don't try to deconvert Christians. I just work with the vast majority of young people who don't believe in God and try to help them figure out what it looks like to kind of pursue, pursue a good life in a religious way. <laughs> like, like to, now, and the reason I say that to you is because when you were talking about how these kids at these Christian colleges have access to the internet and it's, it's much harder to just stay in that world if you're exposed to everything else. I, I don't spend any time attacking or trying to bring down traditional religious belief systems, partly because I think it's a cruel thing to do and partly because it's unnecessary. More and more young people in a world where they have access to all these ideas and where they have access to more and more science just go like, there is no way this Iron Age myth that I happen to be born into is the ultimate truth of the universe. And so there's just... It's just it's just falling apart under its own weight. So what what happens in America now? I know the the sort of nons are on the rise. Uh, the number of people identifying as non-religious. Uh, do you have do you have numbers on that? You know, I, I I don't. I mean, I've seen numbers like they're twenty percent or something like that. But I don't trust any of the numbers because I work with a lot of secular young people who, when you really put the screws to them, they still have some kind of supernatural context still left in them. And I hear from and talk to loads of people that are still in the pews of churches, that are still on the staffs of churches, that are still missionaries in the field of the of the evangelical community who quietly don't believe in God. They're nuns, but they, they can't afford to say it because it would cost them their marriage or it would cost them their job or it would cost them their identity. And so I don't what I what I do know 
from my own experiences that when, that when I'm on a college campus, particularly at like, I'm at an elite college where, you know, it's a very, these are some of the smarter kids, you know, that, that the, that it, it is really high there, that, that this, this yeah. sense of, yeah. you know, and, but when you say the nuns are on the rise, what I would say is the nuns are multiplying. Like there's more and more of them. They are not happy people right now because they have lost their one religion, but they're still, many of them are what I would call religious by nature. And what I mean by that is not that they believe in God by nature, but they want to understand their individual lives in relationship to some larger narrative that gives meaning to their lives. They want, they want something in their life that serves the purpose that religion does serve for all of us, which is to answer life's ultimate questions, to tell us where we come from and where we're going and what happens when we die and what makes something right or wrong. And, and so they, many of these young people, they can't buy into the old traditional supernatural religions, but they haven't yet come up with a new narrative. And they haven't yet come up with a new ethos, a new way of life. And they certainly haven't found a new community. And so they struggle greatly. And that's that's where my work is at, is trying to create community for people like that. And then in the context of those communities, sort of come up with a kind of a religious naturalism to replace their religious supernaturalism. Okay, so let's talk, because you've, you've said supernatural transcendent. I thought we were talking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <So> <laughs> what? Uh, See, let's talk. I thought we were talking. No, I said you said uh, supernaturalism and transcendence. And so, you know, the listeners of the podcast, I assume, if it's not their first time listening, knows about those terms. But I want to know what, what you mean, because I would claim, you know, if if there are some 20% of non-religious in America, in Sweden, that number is probably 80 or 90% among young... Among young pagans, you're a bunch of pagans. Yes, you know, you've seen Vikings, you know what we're about. <laughs> Maybe even more than 90% among young people. Right, right. But these young people still have an understanding about goodness or about beauty or about truth. I would still say that you can see the Christian heritage in the way they relate to these concepts as transcendent concepts. Uh, no God, but still there are these values and, you know, the critics of religion like Nietzsche tears that down as well. But I, th so I oftentimes say to my secular friends here in Sweden that they should read the secular critics of religion and allow for that criticism to actually be directed at themselves because they are still religious, even though they don't recognize it as such. But you see, like, again, it all depends on how you understand religion. If you understand religion as having to do with supernatural beliefs, I, I don't have a bone. I don't have an ounce of that. But if you understand religion as organizing your life around the, the quest to answer life's ultimate questions in a collective way, that's what I'm all about. And what I would say is those kids, I don't know if they need to read the secular critics of religion. I'll tell you what they probably need to read is a little bit of um, cultural anthropology and, imp and, and evolutionary anthropology because what you or, or, or just study primatology. Because what you find is, is that human beings like bonobos and elephants and dogs and wolves are a tribal species. We thrive by cooperating. Like that is our, our evolutionary strategy is to care about each other and, and to define right and wrong, not in terms of what's good for me as an individual, but also in terms of what's good for the group. What works for us together? And that's, and what you find is, is, is that do dogs have a code? Sure. Do elephants grieve their dead? Absolutely. Do bonobos negotiate and create, um, you know, forgiveness? Do, 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 are, are there, is there peacemaking among bonobos? Absolutely. And so what happens is, is that the more you understand where morality really comes from, that morality isn't handed down from above. It isn't a transcendent concept. It isn't a supernatural force that exists out there and we discover it. But that morality gets created by social animals in relation to each other. They end up defining good as not what's good for you or what's good for me. What's good is what's good for us, what's good for the group. 
And once you start to understand where morality comes from, and then you go, religion comes later. When the group gets so big that we can't enforce our morality through shunning and gossip and exclusion, then you go like, well, then we have to invent a big eye in the sky who's watching you even when the group can't watch you and, and will punish you in another way. We've always thought that religion invented morality. But in fact, the truth is it's morality that generates religions. And so I think that, that when your young people there growing up, they, they, that is the, the vestige that they have is they think, well, this, this love in my heart it must come from somewhere out there. It's like in the chakras, it's in the, the life force of the universe and they become kind of new agey. Like there's something about, and it's, it's much simpler and yet more beautiful than that. Life generates consciousness, generates loving relationships, generates morality. I mean, our like morality is an emergent thing. Seven billion years ago, when there were no conscious sentient beings, nothing could be right or wrong. Right and wrong don't exist in abstraction. They only exist in relationship. What you see happening and what I'm sure you see happening, I see it here all the time is, is that these kids are growing up in affluence and they're also growing up digitally, like they relate to each other through internet. They, they don't do a lot of face to face. Sometimes they show up at college without much empathy because they don't know how to read each other's faces. They're not very socially apt or adept. But what happens is, is that then they come to my office and they say, I'm lonely. I don't have any relationships that really mean anything to me. And the question is, do you not see in this, in this, in this era of affluence and technological growth, all these kids are in counseling. All these kids are depressed. All these kids are taking ADHD medication. All these kids are saying, I feel disconnected. I don't feel any loyalty. I don't feel like I'm part of something. And you say, what will happen? And what will happen is they will be drawn to people and they will be drawn to situations where somebody learns how to recreate for them the village, recreate for them the tribe, recreate for them a sense of shared commitment to not just to one another, but to out uh, to, to making the world better for other people. And so what I think is like, I think we're, we're at the begin we're, we're in the, we're in the, the really weird, miserable liminal space where people's, the, the old religion that gave meaning to life doesn't work for people anymore because the narratives have been disproven and, and you just can't sell that stuff. And the new kind of way of pursuing goodness in a, in a kind of a collective way hasn't yet emerged. And that's, I mean, and that's what I think, honestly, like if you got, if you got thousands of people listening to this podcast, if there's anything I would say to say, say to them, like as an, as an evangelist of goodness is I would say, listen, ultimately all this theologizing is of no value if it doesn't translate into building communities of people that genuinely love each other, that genuinely work together to make the world a better place and that cultivate in each other a sense of wonder and a sense of gratitude for the privilege of being alive. Even though that gratitude isn't focused on an external person, it's just focused on, oh my gosh, of all the matter and energy in the universe, we just happen to be the conscious stuff. What a privilege. You, you said it's that miserable time in between, but it's also an exciting time if you're a creative person, if you're someone who wants to give something to other people, because there's really a space here to work with. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like, I feel like when I work on my little community, like, you know, I'm, I'm sort of pastorally caregiving in this group of secular students at USC, the secular student fellowship. And of course, like all the stuff I learned as a Chris, as an evangelical youth worker is completely relevant. Like, all those, all those ways of connecting with people, you know, we do the equivalent of a Bible study, except we do it around any, any good book we can find. We read it and we ask, how does this apply to our lives? You know, is this true? How do we make sense of it? But when I'm doing that work, Joseph, it's, it's like, I feel like I'm one of the people in Silicon Valley 50 years ago in a garage tinkering with like, you know, old time computers. And like, there's, everybody's out there and there's a few of us that have figured out that, that these things are the future. 
and we're trying to figure out how they work. And and I may not I may not come up with the one that works. But like if if I fail terribly and somebody the person coming after me figures out like don't do what Bart did, do it this other way. But eventually, this is the great need of our time because the the economy that this this affluent economy is going to collapse, and there's going to be a global climate problem, and there's probably going to be some kind of major you know kind of nuclear event, like something terrible, currency collapse, like something terrible is going to happen. And a lot of people are all of a sudden going to be in poverty and in need and looking for meaning and purpose and belonging. And you and me, it's like we're on the deck of the Titanic building lifeboats because we know it's going down. And it is kind of exciting to think like we've got to come up with a way for people to, 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 to be together and to help each other grow and find hope that has nothing to do with God because most of these people can't believe in God. Yeah, and the thing is, this is something human beings has been doing throughout all of history, trying to survive together. It's just that with the technological developments and so on from industrialization and forward, we've entered into a an age of individualism where it's like, I'm going to realize myself, I'm going to go to India and find myself, that shit. And the thing is, if this individual that we've been so last. much in love with that's actually taken the place of God is if that individual is now dead, then atheism becomes something different than the atheism you critiqued before as being this sort of angry atheism, because I think that's too much just a negation of of Christianity, frankly. Yeah. And a lot of those people, they're angry for good reason. They got really hurt. Some of them are, of course. But but the thing is, when you say it doesn't really matter if I do it or someone else do it, it's just we're doing this together. I think that's the novelty here, because for so long it's been we we're looking for this new leader to tell us what the world is like and how we should live our lives. That's not on the map anymore, because this is something that we're doing together. It's also wait, 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 wait. Let me interrupt you, because let me tell you something. The real problem that I've discovered in the secular in the secular community building movement is that a lot of times these people that want to build communities are so anxious to have them not make the same mistakes of church or of other, other religious organizations that they say, you know what? Those people have charismatic leaders. So we won't, we'll do everything by committee. We won't have anyone be in charge and they falter because the truth of the matter is, is that the answer to bad charismatic leadership carrying bad narratives is not no charismatic leadership. It's accountable charismatic leadership with a decent narrative. Like y people need leaders. See, there's the theology from your past coming back. The, the, you know, if you have a bad theology, that's not the problem. Theology is not the problem. You need good theology. Well, I, I'm just talking about like, <laughs> I, you should. Yeah, I, I'm I, just no, joking. You're right. You're right. Like on some level, there is a sense in which Bart, you're just trying to reinvent this, something with a different branding. But what I would say is, is that if you look at all of human history, like show me any significant human endeavor, whether it's a school, a company, a, a, a dictatorship, a civil rights movement, um, show me anything that human beings have done that hasn't rested on charismatic leadership. That hasn't had somebody that hasn't had somebody lead the charge. Yeah, you know, we are tribal species, and you, that's one of the aspects of being tribal is that tribes tend to revolve around having some kind of accountable leadership structure. And so, when when I see secular people that think that we have evolved to the point where we can, where where we don't need leaders, or where you, you know, I, I just think like you know, good luck with that. I, I, I still haven't seen anything emerge that didn't have leadership. Yeah, I, I, th I think you're correct about that. But perhaps we can have a more uh, developed understanding about what leadership means uh, and how it's actually something that you're doing because you're part of a group rather than you want people to follow you. Oh, my gosh. So I, I don't know if you know this, but I got written up in January in the New York Times magazine. Big article, big picture of me. And in this country, that's a big deal. Like all of a sudden, my my email box is, you know, f hundreds and hundreds of emails from people, right? So in the midst of all that hubbub, I get a call from this guy from a science magazine 
called Nautilus. And he says, I'm writing an art. This is, we do it. We take a different subject for each issue. This issue we're writing about charisma, the pat, like Trump kind of charisma, like, like people that get people to follow them. And he said, I've been talking to scientists for months about this. He said, but I haven't yet interviewed anybody who actually has charisma. <laughs> and he said, I read that article and it seems that not only do you have some charisma, but your father had even more. And, um, and so he's like, did your dad teach you charisma? He wanted the code so he could <laughs> emulate it. He yeah. did. Exactly. He totally wanted the codes. And so I ended up, he was super nice and I ended up being really expansive and explaining to him how I learned to manipulate people. And, and he was fat. He was like, this is like a craft. Like I, you know, he thought it was like some magical formula or some, or like some magical, like, you know, gene that you have or you don't have. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like you got to have some gene, but you also have to have some training. And we ended up, so, so, I mean, you could look this article up. Yes, I will. I'll link to it in the show notes so that people can. Yeah. Your readers don't need to read it, but you would love it. Um, and, and here's the main thing. The main point of the article is at the end of it, I say, the thing you have to understand about charisma is I think of it like fire. And that is, it's neutral. You could use it to heat your house or you could use it to burn your house down. And that the key is not to try to get escape from charisma in human interaction, but rather to teach people to recognize how it works and how it's used so that instead of being manipulated by it, they can, they can use it judiciously. Cause like, like when I get on a roller coaster, I know how it works. I know they're going to scare me, but I, because I understand how it works, like I'm still in control and, and, and like, I can go like, yeah, I want to be scared right now. So let's do it. And so in a sense, you want to be able to understand how charisma works so that you can see when it's being used responsibly, but you can also see when it's being abused, like by our president um, at this moment. And you can recognize that and see through it. So like that, it was a really cool experience where it was like the guy was saying, hey, I'm, we're going to talk about the science of charisma. But then he says, you know, what is your solution to it? And, and of course, my solution to charisma is bring it on, but teach everybody how it works so that the people that use it are transparent. Yes. And, and I think that's that's something that most people understand that's a good idea what you just said but when a charismatic person stands there it's very difficult at times to resist it yeah yeah and and that's where I, I mean i really think even from the time kids are little we need to like teach them how it works like watch watch a a, a, a charismatic politician and tell them like oh now, now now notice what he's doing here he's telling a story that and this is how that works or see how he's modulating his voice up and down and he, and, he, and he takes it down to this point so that you have to get really quiet to listen to him. And then you, you, you need to actually show people, OK, now there's a really difficult person in the back of the room. He's speaking directly to that person because he needs to get that person under control, because if he doesn't get that person under control, his illusion of his illusion of control of power will dissipate and you need to show them how the tricks, you know, how the thing works, because like we all know how movies are made. Like now that we see these behind the scenes things, we know how the CGI works and stuff like that. It doesn't eliminate the joy of watching them. In some ways, it enhances it. There was, was that something when you were an evangelical preacher that you learned how to clench your fist and, you know, how to control the room and stuff like that? Oh, no, you don't learn it. It's the Holy Spirit gives you that gift. <laughs> no, of course you learn it. Of course you learn it. And, and people say, gosh, Bart, isn't it so strange that you're a good upfront speaker? And I go like, it's not strange at all. I, I grew up traveling around with one of America's great preachers. And what do you think we talked about on the way home from each engagement? You know, like, why did you tell that story? What happened there? You know, Bart, did you notice this? Like my dad was, my dad was sort of in a sense cultivating or, or, you know, training me to be somebody who could motivate people 
to good works from the time I was a little boy. And the real thing is, you know, like the thing I love about my dad is he could have made with that, with the giftedness that he has, he could have made a lot of money selling insurance. He could have made a lot of money. He could have got a lot of women into bed using the same t- techniques for seduction. As Kierkegaard once said, he who cannot convert a man cannot, or he who cannot seduce a man cannot convert him either. You know, like my dad could have used those skills so many different ways. And he said, and, and, and you know, the beauty of my dad is he said, I'm going to use these skills to get young people to do things that will make their lives better and that will make the lives of other people better as well. Yeah. And that, you know, that's kind of the beautiful thing when somebody harnesses their gifts to do good in the world. Yes. And I mean, I, I, I haven't seen this movie yet, which isn't yours, but you're in it. Uh, but there is a little clip in the trailer where you say to your father something like people say we're so different, but at the same time, we're very much alike. And I think this is, I mean, what you're telling us now about your father, it's what you're trying to do with your own charisma today. I, I hope so. I mean, it, we wrote this book together too. this a book called Why I Left, Why I Stayed. And it's not a debate book about like whether or not Christianity makes sense. It's really my father saying, OK, so you don't believe in God anymore, but I want to stay close to you. Tell me how life works for you. Tell me why you left. Tell me what you're doing now. And it's me asking, how do you stay in that? Like, these are the problems I had. How do you overcome those problems? But the main thing we're trying to communicate is, is that people don't choose what they believe. They really don't. Like, you believe what you believe. I, I never tell people I won't believe in God. I always say I can't. Um, cause, cause it's not, you know, it, it's not possible for me to believe in God anymore. Um, you could put me on a lie detector test and, and tell me you're going to murder 10 million orphan children if I don't accept Jesus, reaccept Jesus as my personal Lord and savior. And I would try, but I would fail the polygraph because I just don't think that stuff really happened. Um, but the question is, since people don't choose what they believe, the question is, how do we, who don't. How do we who, who, who see the world from a naturalistic perspective, who think this is all there is, how do we lovingly relate to people who do believe in God? And how do lo- people that, lovingly, that believe in God lovingly relate to people who don't? And that's, I mean, if there's anything that my dad and I are a good example of, it's two people that think completely differently about the most important things in the universe and yet still desperately want to stay close to each other. Maybe it's your mom who writes in the preface or it's your dad saying that it's help can be helpful to read this for people going through similar things because there's a lot of broken relationships as a result of younger people moving away from from the faith their parents desperately want them to have. Yeah, and I I would think that even some of the people in your audience they may still be believers, or they may still be Christians and not believers. You know, they may be those kind of progressive Christians for whom, you know, Christianity is a language that they use to express higher truths. But even if, if you move, even if you don't leave it all together, if you move sufficiently far, it can put a real gap between you and the family that you grew up in or the people that you're close to. And we all have to get better at learning how to support other people's pursuit of goodness, even if it doesn't look like our own. So the question is, if my father calls me and says, I'm going to this speak engagement, I don't really know, I I don't know which sermon to use, or I don't know what I'm going to say to these people because of this situation. The question is, do I use my long knowledge of the evangelical community? And do I sit and go like, well, dad, what if you use this Bible verse? Wouldn't that work better in there? And you say, why are you helping him make his sermon better? And it's not just because I like him. It's also because I want him to preach a sermon that motivates those people to do something great for Jesus. Yeah, and that's beautiful. So I I wanted to ask something. Uh, There's a philosopher, Quentin Millis, who uh, he and other have said similar things that uh, God is too important to leave to the theologians or to the Christians, perhaps. So uh, even though, you know, you have a naturalistic perspective, uh, can't theology or theological language be used to express what you're thinking or 
is it dangerous? Because I had a, a conversation maybe a year ago with Leron Schultz. Do you know who Leron? I don't. I don't. He was he was an American fundamentalist from Texas, and he is now an atheist living in Norway. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he he made a little bit of a trip in his life. Uh, but he t he talks about this uh, use of theological language that you know for people like myself who still use theological language, uh, and he says that's okay. You know I know what you're saying when you're using that language, but the the issue is when you have a group using theological language and you end up under pressure. <laughs> Oh, it's like the BBC thing. Your kid's coming in the room. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. So, so Laurent Schultz says that if you have a theological language that you use, and perhaps you can pass the test, and I think his examples were Jack Caputo or Catherine Keller, that would be okay. But when you end up under pressure, when you, perhaps there is a situation, there is a war, there is a famine, there is there is a problem, suddenly that starts to to be used again as we did in the in 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 the old days where our god is against your god and so the use of theological language is is dangerous when people are under pressure yeah i i think that he's he's right and he's wrong he's probably right in both ways what i would say is is that i've seen that in in actual personal relationships, that if you continue to use the language in that kind of sort of precious way, where we know that when you say God, you really mean universe. And we know that when you say Jesus, you really mean like love, um, and, 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 and or tra a transcendent feeling, um, that when you use it that way, when the pressure comes down, sometimes having that language available to you then means you, you could abuse it. Or, 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 or it could be used abusively on you. What I would say to Laurent is, dude, it, I, I feel about theological language the same way I feel about the sunrise. And that is whether I like it or not, it's coming up. Like it's going to happen. And right now, billions of people around the la planet use that language. And if you want to talk to them, that's the way you have to speak to them. That's why, like, you know, when Brian McLaren, you know, when, when, when all those people say, like, we're trying to rehabilitate that language, when John Shelby Spong continues to use all that theological language, even though he doesn't believe in any kind of supernaturalism, a part of me goes, I understand that. And then they look at me and say, why don't you do that? Why could my dad says, why couldn't you just be a progressive Christian? You know, <laughs> and uh, the answer is. That as we move forward, that language is only confusing to new generations because when they th – that you may know that you just mean universe when you say God, but they've got a lot of baggage attached to the word God and they misunderstand. And so the reason why I'm so committed to, 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 you, to creating a new language to, t to talk about the pursuit of goodness is because I think that moving forward, that's, what's, that's what younger people need. And that's what people who have been burned and hurt by that church language need. But, I, but when I see people that are trying to make that church language work, I go like, well, that's good too for right now. As to, like eventually all that progressive Christian language, it won't be useful anymore. Like this, it's transitional language. It's like, you know, there's no God, but you can't give up the songs and you like the smells and bells. Okay. For this liminal moment, you keep using the smells and bells and we know what they really mean. In the future, people aren't going to be as attached to that language because they aren't going to be as attached to those institutions. So I think it's, I think it's, it's like both and for right now, because it's like a title. We're in a title zone. But eventually, I, I, you know, if you do, I think 200 years from now, people are still going to be expressing their commitment to goodness using Christian language. And I would say, like, yeah, there'll probably be a little cult of people that still do that. But it, that, that it, you know, it, it will dwindle to being just that it'll dwindle to being a small group, you know, a small group of people that are sort of keeping alive the old traditions because they find them quaint. Yeah. I, I read a book a couple of years ago at the university and it was called, will the religious inherit the world? And it was 
a book that dealt with the number of births and so on? And the answer to that question was actually yes, because secular people, even progressives, you know, modern people uh, don't get enough kids while religious fundamentalists keep breeding. But here's the thing, Joseph, that guy's right and he's wrong. At present rates of repopulation, it's true. Like I lived in the inner city ghetto and I watched uneducated people having eight kids. Yeah. And I watched super educated, really cool people having like one or none. And I thought, wow, our species is in trouble. The, the least creative, least economically viable people are having the most children. And then, and then a very painful part of me emerges and goes like, yeah, in a really robust economy that can happen when things get tough all the subsidies and all the safety nets and all the care for those, for those families will go. And you go like, do you think that when times get tough, like the smart, rich people will all of a sudden look after their own and those cultures that are less capable and less educated and more crazy supernaturalist, do you think that they will suffer in a really difficult environment? And I know they will. Cause they do, they, they always do. Like, like if you, if you, if you map religious fervor on top of economic ability or educational levels, it always maps like, you know, more and more the, the kind of hardcore religion is for kind of uneducated, economically marginalized people. And when the economy gets rough or when the global event happens, or when all of a sudden you got to be smart to grow your own food the people at the bottom of our present sort of economic system are going to, are going to fare very poorly. That's not a, I'm not saying that with any joy. I'm just saying, no, no, I understand that. Of course. Um, do you think that will happen though? Are you, because you know, if you, if you study this sort of metadata, you'll, you'll see that, you know, the, we're, we're getting better and better. I, I know about, of course, the environmental threats and so on. But if you look at these, do you know, we had a professor in Sweden, his name was Hans Rosling. He just recently died, actually. Uh, but he was very famous. And he did these diagrams with that moving diagrams where, you know, the poor poor countries were at the I saw I remember I saw that I saw that lecture yeah in, in the left bottom corner you can sort of see how they're all moving up to where Sweden is and a few other very developed countries um, and you know the the average age is going up and and so on but your vision for the future is quite gloomy I think we're headed for a collapse yeah I think we're headed for a social and economic collapse I mean I don't know what'll cause it like 2008 it almost happened because if, if currency, if the American dollar had collapsed in 2008 and, and, you know, you know that all of our currency is fiat currency, like it's, it's not grounded in anything. It's, it's all based on the optimism of the people that use it. And so if our currency had collapsed, you would have seen a global, a, a global social, like, you know, police officers wouldn't have been on the street. Like water systems would have shut down. Economies would have, inc would have localized almost immediately. And in, you know, like, I don't see how we get through the next 50 years without something really difficult happening. Now, I read a book recently called The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch, one of the kind of most optimistic books about what's ha what happens when human beings develop the ability to generate new um, knowledge on a rel reliable basis, as has been going on for the last 300 years. And he's like, listen, don't worry about it. Like we will, we solve problems faster than we create them. And he's like, we will come up with a technological fix for everything you're worried about. Um, I'm not, a, you know, like I, I, I'm, I'm not all gloom and doom, but I don't see it happening. I don't see us getting to the other side without there being some really rough correction. And, um, and that's, that's a big part of my work. Honestly, Joseph is I'm convinced that there's going to be a really hard time. Like not like not like there won't be zombies like The Walking Dead, but I'm convinced there's going to be a time where people are going to be thrown into a world in which the only way to survive is to band together with people that love each other and that know how to grow food together and that know how to resolve conflict and that know how to give hope to their children. Um, 
And I, I wanted, I want to try to help young people develop those skills so that when that time comes, they're ready to do it. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not gloomy because I really think that there's a lot to be hopeful about, um, in human beings, but I don't think we're going to get there without going through a really rough valley. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I think that's that's a great way to end it, right? Yes, it is <laughs> because uh, you know I, I, it's like your optimism is so contagious. But I think you know that that's something that people oftentimes confuse. It's like if you if you are an optimist, people expect you to believe that everything will just work out. But that's not the thing. That you know, if you're a realist you will understand there's some struggles ahead, but we need to be optimistic to have a chance to actually uh, tackle them. I can't remember who said it to me, but it was a woman and she said, I'm not optimistic, but I'm very hopeful. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, I don't think everything works out, but she said, my hope is, what, what hope means to me is, is that I believe that what I do can make a difference, can, can impact, can, can, can have an, a, an influence over, over what happens. So I don't think everything's going to work out, but I think that what I do matters and can make things better. And I really believe that like the people that are listening to us talk, you and me, the kids I work with, like, I really believe that if they, if they realize, Hey, this life is the only one I have. The way to make the most of it, the way to be happy is to love other people, to do work that makes things better for other people, and and to cultivate a sense of gratitude and wonder. I really believe, genuinely believe, that if, if, if that, that when people start to grasp that and they go like, hey, the best way for me to spend my life is on pursuing this kind of goodness, I think we can make a difference even though we can't stop the kind of the larger forces of nature or the larger forces that we've already unleashed as a species. And so I think there's a rough time coming. And I think what we do makes a difference. And I think the best way to make a difference is by becoming really good at loving each other. That was Bart Campolo. And I hope that you found him as interesting as I did. I truly had a good time talking to him and I'll keep contact with him. Maybe we can do another podcast to see, you know, where this inspiration leads to. And uh, if you haven't checked out the book, you should do so. Why I Left, Why I Stayed by Bart and Tony Campolo. And if you haven't bought tickets to the Catacomb event in Gothenburg, go to catacomb.info and get your tickets. It will be great. Ola Sigurdsson will be there. Petra Karlsson will be there, Eddie Nels will be there, Sofia Kamrin, Jonathan Beckley, Ludwig Lindelöf, Robert Eriksson. There will be a lot of interesting both practitioners and theoreticians talking about the future of the church and the age of the internet. Why would you want to miss that? It will be great. And for those with the urge to travel, Barry Taylor and I will head to... Utrecht in Holland, May 20th, for an event called Gestrift Festival, I think. I'm not sure, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but it will be great, it will be fun, and Barry is a really, really interesting guy, and we will have fun together. And if you want to buy tickets, check out the show notes, and I'll help you, uh, help you get there. Finally, if you want to support the podcast, that would make me very happy. You then head over to patreon.com slash the catacomic machine and help me keep this stuff going. That's all for today. Till next time. <laughs>